Welcome to the Global Tech Leaders Podcast, where we help business leaders and individual contributors with actionable insights to hit their number and figure out the nuances of truly operating a business globally today, squeezing the essence of the lessons learned from the planet's top tech leaders. This is your guide to joining the fast track to global market scaling. So today's show, we welcome Daniel Vogel, who's based out of Mexico City. Uh, it's very clear uh, Daniel is a serial entrepreneur. He's been involved in the corporate sector. He's been um, spent his college years in the US, and then he uh, worked at uh, uh, Quancast and um, now has set up uh, Bitso, which is a very dynamic and interesting play in the crypto space and the payment sector, which I'm very keen to talk about because we've had a few... Uh, folks we've had on the show recently in that capacity and also uh, to come in the future. So welcome to today's show, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me here, Ross. Very excited to be chatting with you and, and your audience. Wonderful. And uh, you've uh, just shared with me before we started on the call today that you've just opened up your Brazil office. You are, in fact, in Mexico City, but Hola Brazil uh, is on your uh, background here on our call today because you've just uh, launched that. So congratulations. But let's wind back a small bit and um, take us through your career thus far to date. I know you spent some time in my hometown in Dublin and uh, even got to see you too, a small little band, you, you know, some of our listeners may have heard of. So um, maybe just take us through your journey. You know, what brought you to where you are today and what were some of the decisions you took along the journey if you could share absolutely so i think since since i was very young i i've always enjoyed just working on projects and you know actually actually when i was when i was really young i i really liked remote controlled cars uh -huh. and i and i liked the internet I, I remember my my brother came back my brother is about nine years older than i am and so probably mm -hmm. around when i was nine years old he came back from college and he showed me from his first year of college and he showed me his website he'd like in a, in a class he'd built like a website and i was like this is incredible i can do this as well and uh and he taught me a little bit like look you click here and you can see how a website is written and i just started self-learning and um, and then I started a business with a guy from Australia, where we basically were um, we basically put together like a website called rcmovies.com, and we were putting videos of remote control cars doing stunts. And this is before YouTube existed, and before it was easy to upload media on the internet. And we actually built the largest repository of like remote control car videos on the internet, and it was super fun. And, and, and I think like, you know, when you talk to people I went to high school with or whatever, I was always trying to like start a new business here and there, a new idea. I was always, and, and always to do with technology, you know, like I always thought, I always tried to be like a step ahead of everyone in terms of technology. I remember like, you know, when, when CD burners came out and MP3s were just starting, like, you know, my friends had never heard of either of those two things. And, uh, and I could make these CDs with like songs that I downloaded on the internet and, and people were like, how do you do this? Like, and, and, and I always sort of like got a kick of knowing that there was like, you know, just technology that was happening that wasn't mainstream yet and, and, and trying to understand that and, and, and see what opportunities there were on the space, et cetera, et cetera. I went to, um, so, so that all happened in Mexico when I was living in Mexico City. When I was 18 years old, I went and I, um, I I got into Stanford University and I studied computer systems engineering and economics. And and Stanford is a fantastic place for entrepreneurs. You know, you have the stories of Google, you have the stories of you know, it just it's it, it's in the it, in, in Silicon Valley where there's just so much entrepreneurship happening. Mm. Facebook was an up and coming company when I moved to to San Francisco. It was like the thing that everyone was talking about. It was still locked only for colleges. And so it's just like a fun, it was a fun place to be and to learn and to see what was possible in terms of entrepreneurship, but also in terms of like tech entrepreneurship, no? And, um, and that had a big, I think, influence in, in, in everything that I've done since I, um, my brothers had, you know, I always looked up to them and I still look up to them, but they, they went into, into investment banking. 
And I wanted to do that. I was like, oh, you know, they seem to have really enjoyed their lives in New York as investment bankers. It looked, it looked like a very lavish uh, lifestyle and it seemed interesting to me as a college student. Sure. Um, and, and I think I got really lucky that it was a financial crisis as I was sort of like recruiting at, at investment banks, okay. just a little bit out of inertia, I would even say, because of the experience of my older brothers. And, um, and they weren't really hiring or I wasn't good enough for the investment banks at that time. I'm not sure which one it was, but I ended up like interviewing at tech companies and I interviewed at this small company in San Francisco called Juancas. Yeah. And I joined them for a summer internship and I just loved it. I just loved like the, the chaos, the disorganization, the promise of like, you know, changing the status quo using technology. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how I got to spend some time in Dublin because Quantcast at some point opened their, their Dublin offices. And so I made, uh, I made trips to the, to the Dublin offices and really, really enjoyed my time in, in Dublin. But it was, just, it was just great, like living in San Francisco, working at a company that was growing. You know, when I, that when I stepped foot at uh, Quantcast, we must have been like 20 people. By the time that I left, it must have been over 200 and some people. And just like seeing that growth, uh, the use of technology was super interesting. And when I was at Quantcast, I learned about Bitcoin. And so going back to that earlier trend, it was this thing that like nobody understood. It was sort of like, you know, from a, a lot of technologists were like very, very amused by the, by the technology um, because it, for the first time you had the, like you, you could solve this problem of peer-to-peer -peer digital transactions of value. And it was just fascinating. And like, um, I, I feel like like it's been a, a super interesting journey since I learned about Bitcoin. Because first, it was just convincing my peers at Quantcast that Bitcoin was interesting, and you know, most of them telling me like this is crazy. And I remember the first time Bitcoin hit like fifty dollars, they would come to me and tell me like, "You should sell all your Bitcoin. It's crazy <laughs> that it's at fifty dollars. This is a crazy bubble." Blah blah blah, and. Um, and, and it just sort of like, like kept going. I, I, at some point I wanted to, to, to leave San Francisco. I wanted to try something else. I kind of wanted to go back to Mexico and do something in Mexico. I wasn't sure what. Uh, I had the chance to get an MBA. And so I went to pursue an MBA at Harvard Business School. And when I was at Harvard Business School, I basically made it my life's mission to like convince everyone that Bitcoin was a real technology, anyone that would hear it. So I talked to professors, the dean, um, I still have amazing letters I exchanged with the dean, uh, a lot of skepticism for the technology. Sure. And, um, and when I was there, um, the, a, a friend that was at, um, at, at, at Harvard uh, was, was the cousin of one of my co-founders, or is the cousin of one of my co-founders, Pablo. And he went for Christmas to Mexico and spent Christmas with his cousin, Pablo, and he came and, and he was like, you know, there's only two people I know that speak of Bitcoin and they both happen to be Mexican and you guys should talk and you should you should talk to each other. Yeah. And Pablo um, was was working with this with the other co-founder of Bitso, Ben, on basically like starting up, uh, starting up this company. And uh, and I started chatting with them and I just thought like this thing needs to be big. This thing needs to needs to grow. It, it, uh, I think it'll have a good chance of like rewriting a lot of the rules that we have today and, and, and really play a, an important role, sort of challenging the status quo. And I, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I decided to join Ben and Pablo on this journey. And it's been, it's been really fun. Lots of ups and downs, lots of difficult times for sure. But um, but it's been overall a really nice positive experience and 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 something that I've really enjoyed um over the last you know over the last already six and some months years so six and six years and some months amazing so sounds like you had the itch right so I I, I definitely had that itch and you know I've had to try and convince my wife at some point that that itch needs to be scratched you know you have like clearly a great education and you know a lot of employment opportunities you talked about investment banking. Uh, as well, but you decided to go the other way. And it's actually interesting you say that because I know you've been involved in, um, you know, VC and, and uh, capital raising organizations as well and investment banking. And actually had a guest on the podcast last week where they had the same similar background and they decided to, uh, you know, the tech is that perfect mix of disruption, um, which, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so I think for our listeners, you know, I'm 
uh, I'm familiar with what Bitcoin is. And for those who don't know, it's effectively a blockchain, a mathematical ledger that allows you to capture uh, transaction as they happen. And then in order to create additional money supply, you need to process those transactions uh, in high speed computing and such and add back to that money supply, unlike what the federal government do and print money like there is no tomorrow. Um, and as Ronald Reagan said, the federal government uh, to say they spend money like a drunken sailor is insulting to drunken sailors. Um, so I, I just thought that was a, a, an interesting throwback. But um, where do you guys play in Bitso? So, you know, we were working with organizations where there are payment processors at the moment and you're kind of removing that barrier to entry. And, you know, a lot of people will be familiar with transferring money instantly in the likes of Revolut and there's many, many other variations of that um, to kind of remove the barriers to, to payment and remittances. So maybe just take us through where kind of you guys play and, and why you're so passionate about it, if you would. Absolutely. So look, digital uh, value transfer has existed for a really long time. Okay. Um, you know, it's decades old and 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 there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the issue with with the way that it existed prior to Bitcoin is that you relied on you relied on like partnerships or a company developing uh, technology and and putting it out there for their customers, etc. And, and the and, and the big difference between that and, and Bitcoin is that now you have an open standard. And so you can think about it sort of like similar to mail, right? Like you had snail mail and, and that worked and, you know, the, the, the postal service in, in different countries, some places more efficient than in others, but it kind of worked. You could transmit information. And then you had these private companies that came in and said, I want to build mail, but I want to build it better. No. And so you, you, you started to get like the, the DHLs, the FedExes of the world who you could send the money, you could send the money, you could send the letter, you know, transatlantically in, you know, 48 hours or whatever, which was sort of previously unheard of. And that's great. And that's, that's phenomenal. No. Um, and, 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 and when the email came, a lot of people were like, what, what do you need email for? Like, you know, I can pick up the phone and call someone if it's urgent. I can, I can send something via FedEx and DHL if it's urgent. And if not, I can use my postal service and just send mail the way that I've done before. But I just, and, check, and, uh, just say that when FedEx was founded, that was the exact objection that they were given. Um, on day one, they were like, why would you use FedEx when you can use the US Postal Service? And on day one, they had 150 packages and I think they delivered like three or something. So sorry, please continue. But this story has got a theme to it. There's no doubt about it. So please continue. For sure. And so, but, but, but what, what's phenomenal about email is that it's just an open standard and anyone can connect to it. And anyone in the world who wants to talk this open standard can benefit from this open standard. And so, you know, you and I exchanged emails and we don't need to be hosted on the same email provider. We just have email providers that speak this standard. And that's very powerful. That's standards on technology are incredibly powerful. When you look at, you know, the internet, like a website, the, the websites are built on open standards as well. And, um, and, 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 and these open standards have been very, very important. And so Bitcoin and a lot of these cryptocurrencies are built on these open standards that people can plug into and benefit from. And so it's very different from a Revolut because what it's being built on a standard where, you know, if Revolut doesn't provide access to, to people in Zimbabwe because they haven't had the chance to expand there. I actually don't know if they operate in Zimbabwe. I just named a, a, a random country. Um, like you, you can't really do a fast money peer-to-peer -peer transfer using um, using a Revolut, but you can definitely do that with Bitcoin. And so big, Bitcoin is sort of like larger than any company that's building on top of Bitcoin. No? And Bitcoin has, it's interesting because it has no cap table, it has no cash burn. It's just like this open standard on this open protocol that lives across the world uh, on, 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 on this distributed ledger that you were talking about just a minute ago. Mm -hmm. But it's the standard that's fascinating. And so what, and what we're seeing now is stuff getting built on top of these standards. And that's sort of akin to websites getting built on top of the internet. So again, 1990, you know, the World Wide Web existed, browsers existed, but it just wasn't relevant for the majority of the population. Why? You know, 
Like, why would you need, what's this internet thing about? I remember like, you know, it was, it was slow. There was not a lot of content. Uh, you know, companies like Google hadn't figured out how to search and index the internet. And so like, it was, it was complex. That website I was telling you about, rcmovies.com, we used to rely on something called web rings. I'm not sure if you remember them, but web rings were this concept where like you joined a group of similar websites and you put a little thing at the bottom on the footer of the page called the web ring, which for people who like kind of like the content of your website could find similar websites by by navigating on the web ring and people would email us and be like, Hey, you know, I also have a website about remote control cars. Can I be part of your web ring? And you would have like a, a process to accept them or deny them. Cause, cause the internet was just like a difficult thing to use, operate and understand. The first time I connected my dad to the internet, my dad got internet installed in the house cause he thought it was interesting or important. Yep. But I remember the first time we connected, he was like, you know, after dialing up and the sounds and asking my mom not to pick up the phone because it would get disconnected. <laughs> and it was like all this process that you would do to get on the internet. Once we were done through that process, my dad was like, and now what? And I was like, well, now you can like, for example, read the news. And I was excited about it. And he's like, I read the news this morning with the newspaper that was delivered at home. <laughs> like, why is this interesting, right? I mean, well, okay, like, let's see, like, for example, do you want to learn something about a car? And my dad kind of like liked cars. And so we're like, you know, I, I had this website for cars and I like opened and it was just so slow though. I think we went to have lunch and came back to see like, you know, the website loaded. Sure. It was like, it was, it was slow. It was, it had all, all the problems in the world, et cetera, but it was built on these standards and people just like kept on improving and improving and improving these standards up to the point where like, you know, you and I are chatting on top of like, thanks to a bunch of these standards that have been uh, built upon and the improvements that we have society have built upon on, 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 on through the years. And, 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 you know, now the internet is not this thing that you connect to. You're, we're permanently connected to the internet, you know, like it's the concept has, has changed. And so um, we are huge believers that with crypto, you're going to basically see the same where financial services are going to be rewritten on top of these principles because they're open standards, they're more transparent, you know, regulators, when regulators understand these standards, building on top of blockchain is not going to be like a novel thing that you do, it's going to be a requirement, because it'll give them the capacity to do auditing, to monitor in a, in a way that's been unprecedented. And so why we really think that we're going to see an entire rewrite of the financial services space on top of this technology and we want to basically be forefront and so what bitsop does today is we connect clients mm -hmm. that want to access this technology with this technology and so if you want to like you know buy bitcoin or ethereum uh, you can do it very easily through us you, you open an account on bitsop.com or, or or on your app and we're primarily focused on the Latin American market. So we do serve people in other jurisdictions, but we do not serve, uh, but, but, but our, our edge as a company is the Latin American market. And we basically help uh, individuals on, on board on this technology very quickly and easily. And so our customers, for example, include freelancers who do work out of Argentina and get paid in tokenized dollars. Tokenized dollars is just a fancy way of saying like, the, way, the same way that you have a Bitcoin and you can send that Bitcoin around, you can also like have a dollar represented on these ledgers and you send it around. So we have people who get paid on these tokenized dollars and then they have an account at Bitso and whenever they need to like, you know, pay for rent or buy groceries or whatever, they turn it very quickly into their local currency and make that and make those payments. But they're able to receive US dollar payments. Uh, very easily from anywhere in the world at very low cost, 24 seven instantly, which is very, very different than if you were to try today to send a wire transfer to Argentina, where, where it would take a really long time and it would be, and, 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 and the cost involved would be so high that the transaction amount would need to be really, really big. And now you can, you, you get these folks that are doing like, you know, $300, $400 jobs and getting paid in, in, in tokenized dollars and everyone is happy. And, um, instant, and so right. anyway. I love that. Okay, well, I'm really passionate about this, okay? Because I love disruptive technologies and I very much dislike uh, old school, old style bureaucracy. So the banking sector is ripe for revolution. They've had kind of big, big changes 
um, and it, it's inflicting change on them because they've not adapted. So um, here, in, here in, in Ireland, we've had a handful of banks and we've had all of these kind of regulations around deposit structures being at a certain level. And what it's happened is the state had to step in and buy banks at one point because of the financial crisis and back them up. And what that's done is it's actually lessened competition. So you've got all of these really innovative technologies. The banks have kind of forgotten about there or they're not engaged with. They're still thinking like old school paper pushers and they haven't embraced the ability to send transactions. We spoke to a payment provider recently who said, if you make a, pay a payment with Liban or Swift or whatever, it's usually passes through four intermediaries before it gets to the other end. And as you said, everyone lets their little take, take you know, chunk of the pie or slice of the pie, which in my fact, my opinion is bullshit it's absolute bullshit because there's no need for that and what i love about crypto is you can do that in a very very instantaneous fashion and people can realize value so i'm curious to know like what's that done to the latin american market like you mentioned argentina there where it becomes political where the government say well we need to monitor all you know us dollar transactions coming into the country and you can't have capital flight this happened in south africa as well where you know people were just buying big diamond rings and getting on airplanes to take money out of the country and this kind of stuff like how is this changing the, because <clears throat> I work with a lady in Argentina actually very successfully and fantastic to work with, but how has this changed the Latin American market and where do you see it going? Yeah, so look, if you look at the, the financial services space in Latin America, like people have been traditionally, you know, lied upon, cheated with, um, anything you want, discriminated against, um, you know, a, a significant portion of the population in that time is just traditionally not being super interesting for the banks. So, like, that's not my core market. I don't want to serve, you know, this person who, you know, doesn't really have a ton of like funds to store with me in a way that is profitable for me. So, I don't want to necessarily serve them. I think digitization is really changing the nature of that because suddenly mm. serving customers can be significantly cheaper, right? Like you can be at a position where you are, um, or, or you can be in a position where you're like, you know, you don't have any physical branches, people can access on your on, on, on their digital phone. So it's just like the economics sort of like change uh, yeah. very significantly, right? Um, and then the cost of transaction uh, is significantly cheaper, both for you as a, as a business and for them, as a, as, a, as a consumer, you know? And so what we're seeing, in my opinion, is just, again, like just a reinvention of how financial services could work and, and, and the impact of this technology on very important matters like financial inclusion, you know? Uh, growing the financial inclusion in these countries. Mexico alone, 120 some million people. Yeah. There's about, there's roughly about 30 million bank accounts. You're talking about tens of millions of people in the country who don't have access to, like, I'm not talking to you about like investment advice. I'm talking about just basic wow. financial services, like just the ability to store your wealth. Sure. Here, here's a neat story. We um, so one of the things that has grown in the crypto space is like interest bearing the, the, the ability to like put money to bear interest. And so right. this is something that like, you know, banks used to do now. Most banks don't offer you an interest for this, but you used to be able to like, you know, you put your money in, in a bank, they lend it out. And as interest come in, they basically you as the, the depositor would get part of that interest. Some banks still do this, um, but it's but it's a lot less common today. Sure. And, um, and now in the crypto space, built on these open standards that I was mentioning, you get people are doing this. People are setting up like protocols where you can lend and you can lend the money to the protocol and get an interest rate out of that. And people can take out loans out of the protocol. And usually they collateralize these loans. And so like, for example, let's say that I have a Bitcoin. I love my Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin price is going to go up. I don't want to sell my Bitcoin, but I need to buy a car. And so what you do is you put a Bitcoin as collateral and then you take out a, let's say, $8,000 loan for, um, you know, as, as, a, as a down payment to a car or whatever. The down payments are smaller, but whatever. You take some amount as a down payment for your car. And then, um, and so then, then the, pro, the, the, the Bitcoin is sort of like held by the protocol as collateral. And then the $4,000 that you take out, that you took out as a loan, come from people like someone else who wants to 
to, to who wants to save that money and wants to make money on that uh, interest on that money. And so I have a lady that comes to, to my apartment uh, and, 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 and she helps me clean the apartment and, 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 and I usually pay her in pesos, in cash. And at some point she told me like, actually I was, because of the pandemic, I was away from home and I couldn't pay her physically. And she came to the apartment and cleaned it. And I told her if she would be open for me to send it via Bitso, no? Because we also have like a peer-to-peer -peer payment mechanism in Bitso. Right. And so I did that and then and then she was happy with it. And she was like, oh, I kind of like this. It's actually easier. I don't like carrying cash around. And so I prefer if you keep paying me through this through this app. And uh, and, and she has the, capa the capability to like withdraw that money, no? And, uh, and so you started to pay her. And then she one day came to me and said, like, hey, I see that you can buy like dollars on this app. She, she, I don't know if she understands that I work uh, in, in the company or she, I, now she does, but I don't know at the beginning if she understood that I worked on the company. And she's like, can, can you teach me how you can buy like dollars? Because I want to save a little bit and I want to start saving and maybe I want to start saving dollars. So I was like, sure, absolutely. So I taught her how to convert her pesos that I pay her with into dollars. And she told me like, oh, I'm going to start saving here and I'm going to start like 20% of what you pay me. I'm going to put it into dollars because I want to save some money. So she did that for some months. And then I was like, oh, I'm actually going to set her up with an interest bearing account. I'm going to set her so that she can make interest on the savings that she has. So I set her up with an interest bearing account. And, and about a week later or, or, or a couple of weeks later, she comes back to me and says, hey, is this legal? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, like, what is like, what, what, like, what's, what's your concern? And she's like, my balance is going up. And I was like, yeah, your balance is going up because you're making interest on the money that you're saving. And she's like, I don't understand. How can my balance be going up? Like, this must be an error. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, I had to explain to her. I was like, no, look, like, you want to save money. You don't need that money today. And so you're willing to, like, give that money to somebody else who's willing, who needs it today and who's willing to pay an interest over that money. And so, and so, like, that, that's why your balance is going up. It's because you're accruing interest that's getting paid by somebody else. And she's like, I've never seen this. Like any other like, I, I, like bank accounts that I've had, like they charge me just to like check my balance, which is crazy. Like wow. bank, bank, there's, some, there, there's banks in Mexico that charge their customers just for them to check their balance. And sure, they charge you about 50 cents of a dollar, but that's just insane that you're getting charged just to know how much money you have. Like, what are the incentives that they're creating, right? Like, the incentive is nobody wants to put their money there because anything you do, you get charged by fee, no? And so she was like, this is crazy. I've never seen it. And she's super happy, no? And now she's building, like, slowly her, 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 her savings account and making interest on that. And she's ecstatic about it. And so these are the kind of things that are just fundamentally different that the technology allows us to do and that I think are just, like, amazing and so I'm, I'm 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 super excited about everything that we're doing because we see the impact that it has on people and so um and so that's just amazing wow okay so let me just take a breath for a minute there okay because i and i'll tell you why because i try and explain to you know my parents my wife's parents what and blockchain and Bitcoin technology is. And, you know, I, I try to explain about it's the democratization and the freeing of money. And, you know, uh, the, my father-in-law, I said, it's about the only way to change the money supply is to mine more things. And he's like, well, the money supply has always been a problem. And he just wrote it off. And that's kind of how he deals with things. But what I loved about what you said there, it's true. I could talk to you all day about that. Uh, but what I loved about what you said there was, you gave a perfect example of a real world scenario where somebody has been impacted by this really positively. And you're removing the ability of governments to charge interest and to control interest and monetary supply. I mean, my parents talk about 18% interest right on their mortgage. They talk about it going from 15 to 18% overnight to control inflation. I don't ever think we're going to see anywhere near interest rates at those levels again, but you're removing that layer. You're now saying, no, no, we control the transaction piece which is really, really cool. Um, so thank you for providing that hugely relevant example because it's real world, right? Somebody can see it on their phone right there and then. So it's proper democratization. But just shifting gears for a moment, what other platforms do you feel blockchain technology lends itself to? Like you mentioned about websites, et cetera. Like 
where do you see this going? M money is a, a great example, and we can stick on that if you want. But like, where else do you see this going by way of revolutionizing other industries? Yeah, look, so so obviously, like we, we believe that in terms of financial services, you're going to see like a complete rewrite and we can spend mm. so much time and money is very central to that. But like, you know, just some neat, neat examples to cover there. Um, so we talked about like the, the opportunity to bring like a, a savings accounts in a more meaningful way to place in the world where that's just never been accessible. Um, combat a uh, hyperinflation like we operate in Argentina uh, where where you know someone my age has seen their life savings gone to zero multiple times just yeah. because of hyperinflation and and so like store of value is like this very interesting thing that a lot of people in the crypto space talk about and and we see it both in Bitcoin but we also see it just in like stable coins and giving someone in Argentina access easy access to dollars um, in terms of remittances, so there's about last year there were about 40 billion dollars that went from the U.S. to Mexico in the form of remittances. These are Mexican nationals that you know can't find the right set of opportunities in Mexico to to like you know uh, you know feed feed their families, and so they migrate into the United States and then they send sure. money back. Sure. And uh, and 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 we did uh, in Bitso about one point. Well, over 1.2 billion dollars uh, from the 40, so so just about three percent of the remittances from the U.S. to Mexico wow. last year. Amazing. And so money, money transaction. But then when you look at much broader, um, we think, for example, like um, uh, like we're seeing a, a, a lot of tokenization of stuff, and so like you know um, land property rights. We're starting to see. Uh, like the, the big the big story in the in, in 2021 has been these things called nfts which are called non-fungible tokens and a lot of it related to art and so like digital art but it's more than the digital art it's like the proof of ownership over the digital art right and so like these th this concept of like being able to sort of like prove that you are the owner of whatever your car a piece of art whether it's physical or digital whether it's uh, whether it's land, etc., and the technology really has a lot of like advantages over the current system, and so like again, when you when you like Dub Ireland is a is a is a phenomenal place. Like rule of law is, is you know you don't really question a lot the rule of law, but you need to go to a place like Mexico where you know I have a friend whose father passed away about three years ago, and and there were like multiple peoples who multiple people who showed up to claim a piece of property. And there were like notarized documents um, that basically showed two different owners for the same piece of property. And it's like, how the hell can this happen, right? And, 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 and you can call it whatever you want. And, and, and countries have fixed this without requiring blockchain. But when you look at like um, blockchain technology and the ability to sort of like really keep a great history of how something has changed or, 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 or how, how its ownership has moved uh, over time, like it's very, very interesting. It's very, very interesting because it allows you to think about doing things fundamentally different. And so like we think that public notaries um, are going to change. And we, we, you know, we think there's a lot of a lot of advances that are happening in the technology and that the technology is going to be fundamentally centered in a in 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 a new world no? yeah i couldn't agree with you more that's another great example um, and I, I i'm excited for your growth that you're going to see i mean you mentioned 40 billion there and you, you had 1.3 percent of that that's fantastic and uh, more power to you and i've no doubt that's going to grow but i suppose if we take this and look at how you grow a company, um, you've been doing this, I guess, for six years, six and a half years now coming up on uh, phenomenally successful, obviously great product market fit and uh, plenty more to grow into as well. Um, how do you find growing the crazy, right? So what I mean by that is how do you adapt? How do you work as a leader? How do you set the tone? How do you communicate with your people? How do you get the best people? Uh, talk to me a bit about that, if you would. Yeah, so so this is a great question. Um, I think I think these companies, you know, like there, there's not there's not a lot of repetitive work that happens at Bitso, right? Like when you look at 
I love this Charlie Chaplin movie, Modern Times. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it, but he's like in this factory and he's just like, he's just like, you know, talking about sort of industrialization and he's just like moving the range the same way, the same way, the same sure, way. Sure. It's sort of like goes crazy. Um, but there's nothing, there, nothing like that goes on at Bitso. There's like very little, if any, repetitive work. And so what that means is that the social capital of your team really matters a lot in basically moving yourself forward. It's not like I can hire and train a hundred new people to move wrenches the same way. And then I can basically like grow my output by a hundred times, right? Like it, it, this is fundamentally different. I depend on people who are committed to our mission, who want to rethink with me the status quo and who want to work together and making that a reality. And so it's very, very, very important to surround yourself with a phenomenal team of people. And it needs to be an incredibly interdisciplinary team because when you think about crypto, like the challenge is pretty big. Like it's not just, you know, package this slightly different. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of technology developments that need to happen. There's a lot of like design elements that need to be solved for. There's a lot of communication efforts that need to be done, education, et cetera. So you really need like a very diverse team that can help you bridge all of these gaps across all of these different dimensions and can help you get to a place where you're basically like, okay, my value proposition is clear. My clients are happy interacting with us. And you're at a place where, where you can continue to sort of like chase your dream and continue to grow and continue to do interesting stuff. And so anyways, so, so, so the way that I always think about the business is who, who can I hire, not for the necessities that I have today, but for the necessities that I'm going to have 24 months in, in advance? Because these, these companies just grow so much and change so much. And the challenge, you know, the challenge is just so different every time that you kind of always need to be thinking um, ahead of time. Like if you're just trying to meet your current need, um, you, you, you're going to under hire. No? And so you need to be over hiring and hiring these individuals that are smarter than you, that have seen problems that are bigger than you um, and, and that want to be part of your mission. However, I think a key component of that is what is, what is your culture? What is the culture that you want to have in your organization? Because not always bringing the most experienced individual in a specific area is the right thing to do for you and your company because there are nuances to to everything that you do you know? and how do you behave and how do you look at the world and what's important to you and so like for example like something that for me has always been very important a bit so is i i, I want to run a company where like people who work here care about the growth of the company um more so than their own sort of like personal growth the, the, the project is bigger than any one of us. And of course, I want people at Bitso to grow. I want people to be exposed to like super interesting problems and, and complex situations. And, uh, but I want the results to speak for themselves. I want these people that, you know, whenever they want to leave Bitso, if they ever want to leave Bitso, that people want to hire them because like they're just amazed at what we've done as a company, you know? Not because, because you know, we, we, they were on sort of like a personal journey to improve them, to, to like market themselves better and so when we think about like um like our company values we have we have three values as a company our first value is drive change and so when we talk about drive change what we're thinking is like you know we want people who are proactive people who are creative you know they want to they want to look at the world at a different way and they want to be creative people who are just hungry for like for growth hungry for a change hungry to, to, to challenge the status quo. Our second value is what we call be human. And so, you know, I, we talked a little bit briefly about sort of like this discrimination and, this, and the issues of, uh, of abuse in the financial services industry, specifically in a place like we are. And so like, when, when we think about being human is, is both an internal ask and an external ask. And so that's all about empathy. And so how do we, how do we, how, how are we, like, how do we show empathy to our customers? Right. It's it's about respect, no? Um, sure, to each other in the company, but also to our uh, our external uh, sh uh, stakeholders, which are our clients. Yep. And then humility, and I think humility is this thing that I was just you know talking to you about just recently. But 
But humility for us is important because, you know, not because we are today on the forefront of technology means that we'll be able to stay there. And so if technology has taught anyone anything, is that disruption is just an ongoing thing and it's never going to end. And so how do you stay humble um, and, and, and open to, to yourself being, you know, completely disrupted? And our last value is probably the value that um, most people in the company struggle with. Uh, we call it embrace your freedom. Okay. What and embrace your freedom. Is, sorry. What does it mean? Tell me more. Yeah. And so embrace, when, when we think about embrace your freedom, like, you know, Mexico, where we started, was well, traditionally a very conservative place when it comes to the relationship between an employee and their employer. And, and, we, and, and we don't believe necessarily in that. Like we don't believe necessarily in having a set days of vacations or having like set hours where you should be able to work, uh, where you should be working. We kind of we wanna place that trust, that ownership and that responsibility back into the team, you know? And, 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 this, and, 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 and like this, this is like a big value for us because it, permeates a lot of the decision-making that we have as an organization. So, so for example, like here, here's a good one. We, through COVID, we started to get into a, this rhythm of like just a lot of meetings over Zoom or over Hangouts or whatever. And people were getting tired. You were just in these back-to-back -back like Zoom meetings. Sure. And, and so the team, like the, the, the executive team was like, how do we end this? No, how do we, how do we end this? And so there were a lot of like super interesting initiatives, everything from like, you know, periods of time where there's no, there's no meetings and, and people cannot send you a meeting request, you know, on a Wednesday morning or whatever. Um, and then there was one, one um, someone suggested like, look, we should have hours. We should have hours where like, like you know, you cannot have meetings before 8 a.m. and you cannot have meetings after 6 p.m. at night. And, and, and initially we're like, well, that sounds fair. Like it seems crazy that you want to have a meeting at 7 a.m. in the morning or at 10 p.m. at night. And then, and then, and then one, of the, one of the, like our CFO, she's a, she's a recent mom. And she was like, you know what? I actually think that this goes against our embrace your freedom value. Because as a young mom, like at 8 a.m., I am feeding my kid. And between five and seven, I don't want to work because I, I need to be like, uh, you know, caring for my kid, putting, putting him to bed, getting him to home, whatever it is. And so I'd much rather work later in the evenings. And if someone else wants to work with me later in the evenings, like we should just put that trust on them that if, and, and that responsibility and that ownership that if it doesn't work for them, that, you know, that, that, that they will embrace your freedom and, and tell me that that's not a time that they want to be working at. But I don't want to be limited as a young mom on as to when I can do work or not. Let me do my work whenever best fit suits me. And, 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 and this spans a lot more than just schedules and vacation time. It's sort of like a way to think about the, the, the company, right? Like, do, do, do you want to work? Do you need to do to, to like work on something today? Well, you are the judge of that. Like you should be the judge of the, the, the ownership and the, and the trust and the responsibility that the company is depositing in you and that you will gonna make the best decision out of the information that you have. And if that is, you know, you have a toothache and you can't work or something else happened uh, or you need some time with your family, like, you know, just embrace that freedom. And so, and so those are the values that we have as an organization. Um, and, and, and we're hopeful that these values resonate with, with, with the folks that work at, at Bitso and, uh, and that they make good use of them as sort of like guiding principles, no? That's incredible, that's incredible. Wow, that's very, very clear. It reminds me of my time at HubSpot where when we were in Dublin, we actually didn't have the space to have a HR department. So the whole phrase was, um, the developers used to say, we have a HR crit sit, as in, you know, it's not a product crit sit, it's a HR crit sit. Uh, but the philosophy was use good judgment, you know, just use good judgment. We trust and we empower our employees uh, to make the right call. And it, it very much kind of it speaks to me and mirrors the kind of embrace your freedom space that you uh, uh, value set that you mentioned there as well. So as we wrap up here, um, having lived in Dublin, um, you'll probably be familiar with the term crack. Um, and that's not the narcotic variety, as we say on the show, it's C-R-A-I-C. Um, and what we mean by that is not taking ourselves too seriously and having fun. So with all of what we said today, 
Daniel, what do you do today for fun? Have you uh, continued your uh, remote control car uh, obsession or have you moved into real cars like your dad? Maybe share with our audience what your, your fun time looks like when you, when you get a moment. I'm not sure you have a moment, but maybe share with our audience if you could. Yeah, so I mean, I became a recent dad. Um, Congratulations. So I became a dad about a, a year and a half ago. And so that's been, that's been an incredible use of my free time, just uh, seeing my son develop and grow. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I've really loved about the pandemic is that I've just spent all that year and a half with him. And so that's right. been, that's been really amazing. Um, and then, and then when, when, when I'm not with him and I have a little bit more free time, which is, as you say, not, not super common, but one of the things that I've gotten like um, really fond of is um, solving puzzles. And, and these are not, these are not, um, actually I actually don't know exactly how to describe them. Like, look, the latest things that I'm doing, um, I have a subscription to this, in, with this company and they sent me like a monthly packet and, um, and I'm on month five now. And basically it's been all about solving a murder mystery. And, um, and the packet comes in and you have like interviews with suspects and like, you know, the toxology, tox, uh, toxicology report. And you have, you know, the, the map of the place and, and, and like all the circumstantial evidence and stuff. And, and you're just sort of like trying to piece together like who the murder is. And it's been quite fun. And I do them with my wife. Um, we try to do them, uh, you know, on uh, evenings after our kid is, uh, is, 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 is asleep. Um, it's once a month, but it's, uh, but I, I really love puzzles. And so it's, um, you, you get so into the, you get so into the thing yeah. that, that it's so, I find them almost like, um, like therapy, therapeutic, like, oh, sure. like I just, I forget about everything else at work. I forget about everything that's going on. It's just like, I am completely immersed in this thing and it's and it's it's sort of like watching a movie like a like a mystery movie but you are the character and and you and I get to interact with my wife and so it's kind of fun solving these things uh what's the name of the service Daniel they're called hunt a killer <laughs> okay. okay right uh it's it's interesting you say that because my uh, my father-in-law is big into Poirot Agatha Christie you know um a murder in paradise uh, death in paradise uh, so effectively he takes the tv guide and just cues up what he's going to watch i'm a more modern guy my real passion is colombo so i've recently acquired the entire colombo set end to end uh, my wife is actually away at the moment so i'm sitting in watching it um one by one right right the way back to the early 70s now i know colombo is cheating a little bit because you get to see the killer at the beginning do the murder and it's all about how's colombo going to figure this out but i can totally relate to what you're talking about um, and i'll definitely check that out in fact it's something i think a few people in my family will get a huge amount of value from so thank you for that and the tremendous amount of value brought to today's show I think I, I can say this very easily. It's the most passionate and involving conversation I've had thus far in, in the seasons that we've done. We're in season two now. So I just want to thank you a hell of a lot for all you brought to today's show, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Ross. It was a pleasure to chat with you. And, um, and I hope your audience enjoyed the conversation and looking forward to staying in touch. Wonderful. Likewise. You've been listening to the Global Tech Leaders Podcast, designed for both established and aspiring career-focused tech rock stars, as well as helping leadership figure out how to speak global in today's multicultural world. For further details, check out sf-talent.com.